delighted to have Trevor. His uh, Enemies Within is also being turned into a movie, even as we speak. So keep your eyes peeled for that. It's coming out this summer, end of the summer, yes, in, a few weeks. in a few weeks. So without further ado, please welcome <laughs> Trevor Loudon. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Can you understand the southern accent? No. <laughs> okay. Real southern, penguin southern. But uh, look, look, thanks for having me here, you guys. It's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor to be involved with American, you know, with, a, with AFA. And um, yeah, it, it's, I got to know Avi a little bit before he passed. And it was, it was a real, real cool thing. We were both born in the same year, both born in the Southern Hemisphere, him in Melbourne, Australia, me in New Zealand. And I think we had a lot in common. We could see that, you know, if you live in a country like that, we, New Zealand and Australia both faced invasion by the Japanese in World War II. You know, all of our men were over in North Africa fighting the Germans and the Japanese were flooding the Pacific. They were in New Guinea. They were in the right, right through the Pacific and there was no one to stop them. They had the invasion currency printed. They had the, the currency printed they were going to use when they invaded our country. So we can, and then along came Guadalcanal, the Coral Sea, those huge battles in the Pacific that were fought by your fathers and uncles and grandfathers that stopped the Japanese invasion dead in its tracks. You know, my parents grew up under that. That my dad was 12 years old, you know, listening to this every day. The Japanese are coming, the Japanese are coming. And how would you like to grow up in a childhood like that? And I know there's a lot of people gathered here today who have come from countries that have been torn apart by violence, invasions, chaos, and they came to America as a sanctuary, as somewhere where you could still be free, you could still express your opinions, you could build a business, you could build a future, you could provide for your family and safety and security. And America has always been that beacon. You know, Europe was torn apart by war and chaos, much of Asia the same, the Middle East, but America was always that sanctuary, someone where people could look and say, we can go there, we can start again. Well, unfortunately, people, that sanctuary is now under huge threat. The sanctuary that everybody looks to is on the verge of being torn apart itself, is on the verge of being torn apart by financial chaos, political chaos, racial chaos, all of it instigated by people who hate your country and hate your constitution and would like nothing better than to see America reduced to what much of Africa and Europe and Asia has become. We can't let that happen, people. Because if the light goes out here, <clears throat> if the light goes out in this country, where is it ever going to be reignited? Who is going to save the world if not America, people? Ireland, Iceland, Liechtenstein, who is going to do it, folks? I don't think so. But the point is this. When you, live, when you grow up in America, you grow up in the richest, most powerful, most prosperous, most benevolent country on the planet. But there's a very small downside to that, folks. When you live in that benevolent environment, Sometimes you have a problem understanding evil. Sometimes you do not understand that much of the world is in the grip of evil and it has designs on this country. It's very hard to comprehend evil when you live in the middle of Iowa all your life, surrounded by lots of wonderful people and a prosperous economy and everything goes nice and everything smooth it's hard to understand that a lot of the world is controlled by evil forces. And it's especially hard to understand 
that your country is threatened not just by enemies overseas like ISIS, radical Islam, Iran, Russia. It's not just threatened by people like that. Your biggest threat are the enemies inside your own country, folks. Because ever since this country was founded, you know, Europe, the whole history of mankind has been dictatorship, ruled by kings, ruled by emperors, ruled by pharaohs. It's always been a very, very few who have controlled the masses and dictated every aspect of their lives. But America was different. Finally, in all the history of mankind, you had a government that was actually controlled by the people. Where the elites were deposed, you had a government where your rights came from God, they came to the people, and the people delegated a government to guard them. Not to rule over them, to guard their liberties. A huge departure from all of human history. And the elites that were deposed by that massive revolution in human history have been trying to destroy the American system of government ever since. And they've come very close in many times, but the American people have always been jealous of their liberties. They've so regarded their constitution, they would not let their country slip away from them. But we've had the 60s, people. We've had those liberal 60s, those young kids have grown up with all this wealth and prosperity, but very little understanding of their history. And if you get a lot of wealth and your life is very easy and you have no understanding of how that was fought for and how many people died for it and how rare it is in human history, you can let it slip away, folks. And Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is only ever one generation from extinction. And we are on the cusp of that time, folks. We are on the cusp. Now, some people may say I'm exaggerating. You think about this. It's very prosaic. Say, God forbid, the Democrats were elected in the next election, <laughs> Hillary Clinton or whatever. How long do you think you would still have Second Amendment rights, people? How long do you think it would be before they used hate speech legislation to shut down your churches and shut down any opposition to their agenda? And then you think, well, no, we can vote them out of office. Think about it, folks. 8, 10, 12, 20, 30 million illegal immigrants in this country. Hundreds of thousands of Muslim refugees coming into this country from the Middle East. Who do you think they're going to vote for, people? They are going to vote 80 to 90 percent Democrat. Mitt Romney lost the last election by two and a half million votes. You give the Democrats, and this is what amnesty is all about, you give the Democrats 8, 10, 12, 20, 30 million new voters. How do you ever beat that, people? How do you vote them out? Look, Orange County, California, not far from here, was once the most conservative county in the entire United States. And now it's chock full of Democrats. Why? Because they allowed lots of illegal immigrants in there, and the SEIU and the unions went into them and bust them around every polling place they could. They got rid of B1 Bob Dornan. They replaced her with Loretta Sanchez. They have basically flipped your state from a conservative state to a very deeply blue state. How easy is it now to get a, a Republican elected to national office in this state? Virtually impossible, right? all on the back of illegal immigration and the unions and the communists signing up hundreds and thousands and millions of illegal immigrants to vote in your polling places and make you a minority in your own state. Well, that is the plan for America, people. 
That is the plan for this whole country. Obama, before the last election, he tried to amnesty five million people. Hugely unpopular. He knew it would cost them the Senate, but he still did it. Why did he do it? Because Obama is a Leninist, a Marxist Leninist. And Leninism is all about one step backwards to get two steps forward. He gave up the Senate. He said, you can have your Senate, Republicans. I know you won't do anything with it. You can have it because I'm going to get five million illegal voters. That's four million more Democrats. That's going to give me just there enough to make my party a one-party state forever. Just that alone, let alone there's maybe up to 35 to 40 million illegals in this country, folks. They're planning on bringing in a half a million refugees from the Middle East this year. How long is that going to be, people, before you are a minority in your own country? Before you can never, ever challenge their majority again? This country is one election away from a one-party state, folks. You know, if I had, if I thought we had 10 or 20 or 30 years, I'd say form a third party and, you know, build it up and get back to the Constitution and do all it. I'd say we do that. But well, we've got one election. So we have to win this one. And we have got to make sure those borders are closed. We've got to make sure our laws are enforced. We've got to get serious about internal security. We've got to stop immigration from the Middle East, any immigration from the Middle East, except, I would say, Christian immigration. I'm okay with that. Christian refugees. Ben Carson had a great analogy. You know, they say, we'll bring these immigrants from the Middle East. Most of them are okay. Okay? Well, the thing is, most of them are going to vote Democrat for a start. That's the first thing. But the other thing is, this country is being set up for chaos and anarchy. And Ben Carson said, if you've got a great big bowl of M&Ms on your counter, and you love M&Ms, but you know three of them are poisoned, are you going to eat any M&Ms? Are you crazy? So we know that the Islamic immigration, we know that maybe 5 or 10% are potential terrorists, but that's still thousands of terrorist people. Do you want them in your neighbourhood? Do you want them going to your nightclubs or your supermarkets or your schools or your sporting stadiums? Do you want your kids exposed to those people? They say it's Christian charity. We must open the doors of America to bring people in. You know, that's, that's a Christian thing to do. Is it the Christian thing to do to allow a pedophile to babysit your children? It's insanity. It's suicide. It's unchristian and it's irresponsible. It's absolutely unchristian to open this country up to sworn enemies of this country who have no regard for this country, who have no regard for its culture and want to destroy it. That is not Christian. That is suicidal. That's disgustingly irresponsible. So I want to say to you folk, you know, I come from a country that was saved by you. And we appreciate that. We understand in my country how close we came to destruction. And we understand how helplessly were we were without your help. If America goes down, folks, every Western country falls. That's why Avi talked about the Freedom Alliance, people. We cannot survive unless we are allied. We cannot survive unless we stand together and hold true to our values and seek out those who support our values. If we stand, as Benjamin Franklin said, if we hang, we either hang together or we hang separately. 
That's the reality. Now, I don't want to get too partisan, but I want to say this. Please do. We have to win this election. That's just the first step, right? That's the first step. Now, unfortunately, right now, our base is a little bit divided because we're, this has been a very, very contentious election cycle and there's a lot of people aren't very happy that their man did not get the nomination. So what do we do about that, folks? Because if we let this slip away, if we let the opposition win, there may never be another meaningful election in this country. That is the harsh reality. We don't have 20 years. We don't have till 2020. We've got a few months. So we've got a convention coming up very shortly. And we're going to have a nominee coming out of that. It's most likely going to be Donald Trump. But who knows what could happen on the floor? Who knows? But coming out of that convention, we need to be able to unify to take out the Democrats. We have to be unified. So this is what I would suggest that Mr. Trump does straight after. Well, he's got to name his VP at the convention, and it better be a real good conservative, I'll tell you that. It has to be a good conservative. But coming out of the convention, I think Mr. Trump should name his cabinet immediately. And that should be a cabinet designed to unify all the fractured elements of the base to bring the libertarians on board, the social conservatives, the fiscal conservatives, the Tea Party Republicans, the moderate Republicans. And I think it should go something like this. I think he should name as Secretary of the Treasury and he, can, he would name Rand Paul. And his job is to do whatever he damn well likes to the Federal Reserve and the IRS, carte blanche. And then it would have to be Sarah Palin, Secretary of Energy. And it's drill, baby, drill. Drill in your backyard if you want to. Dollar a gallon gas for every American family. And they've got to break the power of those unions. So who do you think would make a great Secretary of Labor? Scott Walker from Wisconsin, people. You do to them what you did in Wisconsin, Mr. Walker. And you know how the federal government thinks they own a whole lot of land out west and they lock it all up. I would make Mike Lee Secretary of the Interior and his job is to give all those federal lands back to the states so you can mine them and farm them for the benefit of your people. Yeah. And we need a strong Secretary of Defence. How about Alan West, for instance? Yeah. What do you think ISIS would think of that one, people? How happy do you think that would make them? We've got to get rid of the Department of Education. We've got to get rid of the brainwashing in the Common Core. I would make Bobby Jindal the Secretary of Education. And his job is to eliminate that department as soon as possible. Go right through. You've got to get rid of the welfare culture in this country. You've got to end that. It's going to destroy this country if we don't. You make Dr. Ben Carson Secretary of Health and Human Services. And his job is to end the welfare culture, restore dignity to our communities once and for all. Go right across the board. I think a great Secretary of State would be John Bolton. And his job is to flip the bird to Mr. Putin and the Ayatollahs. and to rebuild the Western Alliance. And vitally important, folks, ambassador to the United Nations. No one. Ever. Not a cent. Bulldoze that whole building into the East River, folks. But see, this is it. You have got an army out there. I've been all over this country, folks. I've spoken in 43 of your 57 states now. <laughs> Just checking for Democrats, all right? <laughs> and I'll tell you straight, the Tea Parties, Mark Levin, 
you know, Rush Limbaugh, they have built an army out there. You have got a far bigger army than Ronald Reagan had. You know, he took back this country, but he had a few conservatives. You have got millions of them out, now, out there now. You put that army together with a team of leaders like that, who would stand in your way, folks? You imagine Mr. Trump campaigning across this country and all of his cabinet in twos or threes holding mass rallies in every state. Forget the media. They'd have nothing to do with it. You could bring millions of people on board and give people real hope. And would it unify the base? Because everybody's getting something, right? There's something for the social conservatives, for the fiscal conservatives, for the defence conservatives. There's something for the moderates, something for the evangelicals. And can we win without any element of our base? Can we afford to be divided with all the vote fraud, with all the media against us, the unions and the dirty tricks? Can we afford to be divided? Because every four years, people, the Republicans put up a quarterback. One person to take on the entire offensive team of the liberal media. And what happens? They get discredited enough to lose. Well, how about we put our team up against their team? Run a whole cabinet against those liberal media scumbags and take them on at their own game, folks. How would they handle that one? I think this is going to happen, people, because I think right now the GOP is divided and whoever is going to be the leader understands that you have to bring everybody back into the tent. And what better way than to give everybody someone to inspire them? You know, see, we're all in this movement for certain reasons. It might be foreign policy. It might be Israel. It might be the Second Amendment. It might be anti-common core. We've all got things that fire us up. Now, to get us all on the same team, we need leaders out there who are going to give us what we want. So the best way to do that is to name your cabinet and do it very strategically so the whole base gets people they can look up to and there's a clear policy direction so we know what we're gonna get. When you go into business, you don't sign the contract until you know what you're gonna get. When you go to college, you don't get out that student loan till you know what courses and credits you're gonna take. But every four years, we get told we gotta vote for somebody and all we get is nebulous promises. Well, we need a very clear direction, folks, and naming your cabinet is a very good way of saying exactly where you're heading. So I just want to say to you people, I don't want to put a big responsibility trip on you, <laughs> but the world depends on you, right? That is the way it is. America, the world depends on America, and America depends on people as are gathered here today who understand what liberty is, understand what it takes to fight for it and preserve it and are willing to do it. So what I'm asking from you guys, I know what this costs you. I know the time and energy and commitment and money you put into this with very little thanks. But I'm asking for even more of it, folks. Because the next few months and the next few years are going to decide the fate of not just this country, but my country. Not just of your children, but my children. It's at stake for all of us, folks. And if you're going to be involved in politics in one time in your life, and you're going to make the most difference, now is the time, people. And I'm asking you to give it everything. Because there's two things that are going to happen. Either we're going to lose. But if we do, you are at least going to have the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I could. Yeah. 
And what is that worth to you folks? And if we win, and we certainly can win, there's a lot more of us than there are of them. If we win, we can give our children not just the amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. We can spark liberty revolutions all over this planet, folks. Brexit was a sign of things to come, and we can keep that going, folks. So I just want to say to you people, I'm very proud to be amongst you because you're exceptional people, because you have taken the times out of your life to seek the truth and find the truth and act on the truth. And that is a very rare and very noble thing. So I'm very proud to be amongst you. I'm proud to be part of your team and hope that will continue long into the future. But most of all, I want to say I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to your country. I'm grateful to those framers of your constitution who gave us all what we enjoy today. And long may it continue, and God bless you all. Thank you.